Okay, ladies and gentlemen, wel welcome aboard uh, this new episode of CX Punk Chat. Uh, as you know, the philosophy of this blog is pure punk nature. We want to promote individual freedom and anti-establishment view in the customer experience world. The format is quite easy. It is one-to-one. -one. It means one guest, two questions for one challenging customer experience topic, a pure punk uh, approach to the topic. Uh, our intention is to question any fact simply accepted by the mainstream of the customer experience world. And today I'm really happy to have here at Punk Chat uh, uh, Jack Springman. Uh, we would like to chat with him about strategy and in particular about customer experience strategy. And in conversation, I started, uh, uh, you know, commenting uh, uh, Jack Springman articles, and they were fantastic articles that you can uh, you can basically read on uh, on LinkedIn, and you can of course connect with Jack on on, on LinkedIn. And he wrote a lot about strategy, and in particular about customer experience strategy. Uh, of course. All the articles are really supported by, by a, a, a deep study behind. So it's, it's something I, I really appreciated when I, when I went through the article of, of Jack. Let's Thank talk you. about it together. <laughs> Let's talk about it together with Jack. First of all, Jack, tell, tell us a little bit about you and how you are passionate about customer experience. What, what really moved to the customer experience world? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Federico. Thank you for inviting me on this. And thank you for your kind words. Um, so I, I first got involved in the world of customer strategy, customer experience about 15 years ago, maybe slightly more than that. Prior to that, I'd been doing general strategy consulting work, doing a lot of mergers and acquisitions type uh, analysis, but I was looking for something that um, appealed to me a little bit more. Uh, so I started doing customer strategy to drive CRM implementations with a company that was called Inforte. We had uh, Michael Porter and Philip Kotler on the board, and it was a very, very prestigious little firm. Um, and uh, that really felt to me what I, uh, what I wanted to do, because I, I found that what I felt at the time was that organizations were just not very good at creating value for customers. They... You know, if you can imagine back 15, 20 years, we were still in the sort of the grips of the shareholder value revolution and everything was about creating value for shareholders and the other stakeholders tended to get a little bit left behind. And I think, um, you know, for me, you can only grow if you are very good at creating value for customers. It can't be about cost cutting. And so for me, the whole concept of, you know, creating value for customers, so you create value for the organization it really kind of resonated with me and it, it struck me that's what I want to do. And obviously the experience you create, you know, through the products and services you provide. And for me, experience incorporates the products and services and their usage uh, and the interactions you have is just absolutely fundamental to achieving that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jack. So about the two questions, I will go straight, straight to the point. Excellent. So <laughs> you argue passionately that business strategy should shape customer experience design, which in my opinion should sound like something obvious, but <laughs> don't you think that is the norm in the, in the customer experience world? Why, why you argue about this specific uh, uh, topic? Because I really don't think it is the norm. Um, I think I think what's happened is that um, we're starting to see this kind of one size fits all version of customer experience, whereby, you know, the same exemplars are used and we're all encouraged to be like those companies. And I just think it's it's, it's just not the right thing. We need to to reflect that there are differences. There are differences in sectors. There are differences in strategies. And you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at, for example, the, the the CCXP exam, you know, you look at that and you see the six competencies. They start with, you know, a, a customer a customer centric culture, which is which is a conversation for another day. Um, but there's nothing in there about how your organization differentiates, what its brand promise is. There's nothing about decoding that so that you can create an appropriate experience. And again, you go onto Twitter and you'll see lots of people talking about, we want to delight customers. You know, we want to wow them. We want to give them amazing service. 
And that might be the right thing to do. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do. But again, it's feeling like there is just best practice and this is what you've got to do. And it just feels like, no, that's just not the right thing. Um, and, you know, again, when you look at the exemplars, you know, they're always the same ones. They're Nordstrom, they're Ritz-Carlton, they're Disney. And, 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 you know, no one looks at some of these other companies really like EasyJet and, and other companies in the, in the, the ultra low cost carriers, which have grown incredibly fast over the last 10, 15, 20 years. You know, and they have got, they, they've done a phenomenal job at creating value for customers. And they have got a very appropriate customer experience to support their core proposition. But you don't rarely ever hear about them. They're not those exemplars that people like to talk about. And so it just feels to me like it's just, you know, it, it starts, it's seen as an operational issue rather than a strategic one. You know, there's no strategic foundation. When people talk about customer service, customer experience transformation, they see it in operational terms only, not in strategic terms. And for me, the brand promise, the strategy, how you differentiate has to be the foundation for what you're trying to achieve with your customer experience. Excellent, thank you for this uh, explanation. But can you give some examples of how strategy should, should influence uh, customer experience priorities? I absolutely, be delighted to. So. I mean, um, the, 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 the way to classify strategy, there are, there are loads of ways to classify strategy. The one that I particularly like is the, the definition or the, or the differences from, from uh, Fred Viersemer and Michael Tracy, which was a book in the, the mid nineties. Uh, and they talked about three kind of different ways that you can create value. And one was through operational excellence, meaning you could compete on price. One was on product leadership and the other was on customer intimacy. So product leadership is obviously having the best product, you know, with the most features, the most functionality. Customer intimacy is really about um, having a lot of information about customers so that you can create a customized service and you can be proactive in what you're doing for them. So if you take those three, and I'm, I'm not trying to say that we should have a, a, a one of three size fits all uh, approach to customer experience. I'm just trying to, I use these just to illustrate how customer experience can vary and what your priorities should be different, how they should be different in, in, in the different ones. So um, if I dig down into sort of operational excellence and, you know, here again, I'm talking about companies like EasyJet or Ryanair and Ikea, I would also actually argue Amazon comes into this category, but then again, I'd be having arguments with load of people about that, but that's a different <laughs> matter. But, you know, what, what you should be doing there is, I mean, the first thing is you're, you're looking to produce a low price or a competitive price, but also there are other advantages of operational excellence in terms of reliability, you know, and speed. And, and, and you're basically kind of providing a service that is fast, fast turnaround. It's good without being necessarily great, but it's competitive on price. And so you've got to be always looking about productivity gains, whether that be efficiency or effectiveness. You've got to prioritize those continually or else your, your core proposition of being good value on price is, is going to disappear. You also need to keep it simple because as we know, complexity is the enemy of, 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 of trying to be sort of operationally very slick. We know that and we see that again, that the ultra low cost carriers do that really, really well. They, they keep it simple and they're able to achieve low prices and rapid turnaround, which means they get high utilization of their aircraft. I think the other thing is you've got to manage expectations because if you're going to compete on price and you're going to be operationally efficient, you're not going to do everything that customers want. And you have to manage their expectations, probably more than in any other strategy, managing expectations. Again, with IKEA, great example. We all know that we have to assemble that furniture. Now, it's not something that I think the vast majority of us get any pleasure from, um, but we know it's a sort of a trade-off that we have to make to get what is really quite nice, modern looking furniture at a good price. Um, and of course you do need to be, you have to obviously flex for when there are moments of truth, when there are problems, you've got to, to build in that flexibility, you know, and provide the right escalation paths. So, so for me, that's kind of if, if, you're, if you're talking about operational excellence, those are the types of things you should be focusing on if you're in charge of the customer experience uh, design. 
Um, if you're product leadership, well, again, here you're starting to think about, and, and this is where I think sometimes customer experience people um, focus too narrowly. They're not looking at the usage of the product itself as part of customer experience. I absolutely believe that it needs to be, you know, experience encompasses interactions with products, services, as well as the company. Um, and so I think you need to look at, um, you know, how you can how you can basically use the product. And we're starting to see now with the Internet of Things how you can expand the usage of that product. You can start to put sensors in. You can understand how it's being used, both both to actually understand usage, but also improve the value proposition. You know, Philips, in terms of their medical devices, enable doctors to monitor patients through through wearables, for example, as being one thing. I think you can enable customization. You've got Nike, for example, Nike by you is, is one example. And I think if you're in a number of industries like storage providers, Neville Johnson in the UK, all their solutions can be customized. Um, I think servitization, you know, turning the product into a service, again, is very important for customer experience. We saw that with Rolls-Royce and Power by the Hour as being a great example of, of actually delivering something great quality in a different way. And I think you can also, again, um, just expand the range of jobs to be done just from the sort of the narrow product jobs to doing more. So my favorite example in this one is Monsanto, you know, who provide a service as well as providing seeds to farmers. They provide a service with, with sensors in the soil that looks at soil temperature, uh, the, the outside, uh, the, the weather forecasts as well. and um, also kind of taking out the, the, the moisture in the soil. And, and they basically use that information to give farmers uh, advice on when to plant and when to harvest uh, based on, on that information they've collected and forecast. So, you know, you're expanding the range of jobs to be done around the product. Um, and I think, you know, other examples, you can think of companies who are helping uh, people specify what they want right at the beginning of the purchase journey. You know, they help them specify. So they're doing more things in that scope so that they're ensuring that they then basically are in prime position to help them. Armitage Shanks do it. Pilkington do it with glass. They provide a service that actually helps contractors really specify exactly what they're wanting to do. And then you get into the third one, which is customer intimacy, which, as I said, is all around customization. And here you need to create services that collect data. And again, my favorite example of this one is Disney. Disney gets a lot of traction for customer experience, but they've created this magic band, which actually tracks a huge amount of information as to what people are doing inside the parks, where they're going, what time, when. Um, and, and that basically is, is, is extremely useful and they can use it then to, to buy things as well. Um, so it's a really great, but it's actually collecting incredibly valuable set of data. Um, another one would be Credit Karma, who invented the mortgage calculator. You know, they collected a huge amount of information that then enables them to actually find the best best product for their for their for their customers. Um, you've got personalization clearly, which you're trying to achieve, you know, and, and a company that I've worked with in the past, the very group, you know, they went to the extent of trying to actually personalize the gallery page for people when they when they actually signed in. So that when when you signed in, Federico, for example, you get lots of trendy trendy clothes, and when when I uh, sign in, I get lots of very conservative, fusty, uh, dowdy clothes because you know you're trendy and I'm 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 <laughs> Um And then you know I think the third one in that category is really you know protecting customers. And my favorite example here is Caesar's Entertainment. You know they track what their uh, customers are doing in their casinos, and if they find a customer is losing too much money too quickly, they will send them a sort of $20 off voucher to go and eat in a restaurant to actually get them to sort of break the habit uh, of all the things you can do. So there's so much that you can do with the different strategies. And, and that's what I think it's so an exciting area because there is so much that can be done that to try and force it down the same route of let's wow customers and potentially mismanage expectations is, is a dangerous one. Oh, thank you very much, Jack. Uh, excellent, excellent points that you brought on uh, on the table. 
um, thank you very much for the people that uh, are listening to this uh, video pod podcast. Uh, uh, of course, go to Jack Profiles on LinkedIn, uh, read the articles, are extremely interesting. It's a, it's, it, it has even created a framework, uh, uh, you know, to accommodate the general strategy uh, or to accommodate the customer experience strategy to the general strategy of, of, of every company, every business. So very, very interesting, please. And thanks again, uh, Jack. Thank you, everybody. And see you at the next episode. Thank you, Federica.